Next speaker is uh, Josef Šivic. Is the paper or presentation entitled Intelligent Machine Perception. That's the, as a matter of fact, the result of the impact project. So please, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, is it maybe too loud? Is it okay? Okay, fine. Uh, so thank you very much for coming here and uh, for sort of me having the opportunity now with you to share this, um, uh, the results of, uh, of, of this six-year project. And uh, I want to start with a little bit of the, the, the history, the story. So I came here to, uh, to Cirque, to Prague, after more than 15 years abroad at different places. And I remember uh, it, it was almost exactly six years ago, standing right here talking to, I think it was at the time, Czech Radio, I'm coming here, I would like to build a team. But I would like to say that at the time it wasn't quite certain what will happen, how will it work out. So, uh, but I would like to thank, you know, this project and uh, having the opportunity and, and Vladimir Mažik um, uh, to, to, to be here. Um, so what area do we work on? So we work in the domain of computer vision, um, which is about extracting information from images. So our human brain is very good at this. So if you look at this image, you can understand what has happened in the scene. You can you know, recognize the image of objects and people. But you can also think what would happen if you, that maybe you can climb the ladder here, or what has happened in the scene. And still, although the automated algorithms are getting better at this task, it, it's still uh, so far behind what our human brain can, uh, can do. Uh, and just to illustrate that, really what the input is uh, to the automatic algorithm is uh, just a matrix of numbers, where each individual uh, here, the number is the pixel intensity. So, uh, and why the era is exciting is because uh, images or visual information is all around us, from archives of visual information to cameras all around us. And what I found particularly exciting and was exploring in the, uh, in the project is uh, what if we could learn from all this data? And just a few motivating applications. The first one is, uh, is, is learning for automatic assistance. Imagine that you have a system which could advise you uh, how to perform a task which maybe you don't know how exactly to do. Or, and this is really a problem in factories, how can teach a novice uh, a worker or uh, just verify that they perform the, the steps correctly? And of course, in robotics, imagine that you could, uh, the robots could learn uh, from humans, say, what, you know, how to do a particular task and then execute it in a, in a new environment, maybe where a human cannot go, where it's dangerous. A third application area which uh, is exciting uh, f and where we've worked is in autonomous driving. I will not talk about this much. Uh, we do, uh, we have a wonderful partner, Valeo, here, and we have Patrick Perez, uh, who is the VP of AI at Valeo. Uh, Valeo has a large team in this area. We collaborate with them and have which I think are some very nice results, and, but there will be a whole keynote by Patrick Perez in this area in the afternoon. So I really welcome you to come and see this uh, and, and more in detail. He may talk also about our joint work, but they do wonderful other work in this area. So these are, the, uh, uh, these are some of the motivating applications. I, I wanted to put some of the statistics, so really looking back at the, at the project, um, so, of course, we had some publications. Uh, I also want to mention that um, it, it's really, and in the context of the, the, the funding, it was really a wonderful uh, uh, opportunity, so which allowed us for over a period of six years really establish and do basic science, even on the areas which are a bit more theoretical, especially I would like to mention the three best paper awards, which uh, is really Tomáš Pajdla, who was uh, a, a part of the team, uh, which really is, is a very rare thing for someone in four years have three best paper awards at main vision conferences. So there are 8,000 submissions or plus in this, uh, uh, in this area. So this is... Um, I was just thinking who else in the world has done this, and there are people who have maybe three, but not <laughs> concentrated in such a short time. So it is really something remarkable. Uh, and I will not talk much about his results because they are more theoretical. I'll show you more visually, please, so more visual results, but it's really something which uh, is wonderful. And of course, we also did some, and I will show a bit more about the, the competition. So here are some of the statistics. But what I want to really say is that behind this, 
statistics is the people. And so we managed to build here a team of, uh, of you know, outstanding scientists across all levels, from more senior to uh, postdocs, some of them already left and are at different places, to wonderful PhD students. And really, it's thanks to them. I see some of them here, so thank you very much uh, for all the contributions. Uh, uh, to this work. I also want to mention that the project was designed as a collaboration between uh, uh, CIRC here and INRIA in Paris, uh, uh, which is an institute for those who don't know um, uh, on uh, uh, computer science in France. And I see uh, Patrick Perez already here. <laughs> great, great to see you. Thank you for coming. Um, and, uh, and so what I want to do in the... Um, in the remaining time is really just give you some of the highlights of the research which we do, and as I said, focusing on examples. I will not show any equations today. Um, and here, are, here is the outline, and as I said, again, we also had work packages. Uh, these results are more from the work package two and three, the more theoretical work package uh, where Tomáš Pajdla has worked. I will not show you examples, but has been some really wonderful work winning prizes in this area. Um, so I will start with the uh, with, uh, visual language representations. And this is an area where we worked for some time already. And the uh, sort of an example of data source which we really like and we work with is instructional videos. So here is an example of instructional video when someone is showing how to change a car tire. So you, many people, I think, have done it here because we have to change tires for the winter and summer. Uh, but what's, uh, it's really a, spe a specific process with individual steps, and this person is explaining here the individual steps, showing how to use the different tools to achieve the task. Uh, so what's interesting is really a visual data together with a natural language narration. If you don't like the particular video, because maybe there are different tools than you have, there are in fact many other videos uh, of other people showing the same task with different cars and different tools. And in fact, there are really millions of instructional videos online from different areas of car repair, uh, uh, cooking, gardening, or healthcare. So it's really a wonderful source of visual and language data, it's like a test bed where we can play with and we can test uh, our learning algorithms. And our motivation example would be, well, wouldn't it be great if we could, from this data, automatically learn some kind of an instructional manual, which we can then uh, upload to an augmented reali reality device to give instruction to a novice user, or upload to a robot to execute a task in the novel environment. And so I will show you some of our steps uh, in this uh, direction. So, uh, one of the uh, sort of underpinning, what, what I will show next, is, um, is, is learning uh, these large visual and language uh, neural network models, uh, where the goal is to, so these boxes are neural networks which have parameters, maybe a uh, very large number of parameters, maybe going to billions. And the goal is to learn those parameters from this data. And what's interesting is that we can, this data is just available in large amounts in terms of, uh, in the form of visual examples together with the narration, which is automatically transcribed uh, where the person is talking about what they are doing in the video. So in some sense, it's this kind of a free supervision for us, which we can utilize and leverage to, lear to learn these models from a large amount of data. So what we... Uh, what we've done, we've built uh, one of the largest available data sets, video language data sets, still currently available from this instructional data where people are talking about uh, what task they are doing. And the goal then, once we have the data, is to learn these neural network representations in such a way that the visual examples are matching, so they are close in the resulting space to the corresponding natural language description, whereas natural, other natural language descriptions from other videos are far in the space. So there is a cost function which one can formulate, but I will not go into uh, the details here. Now, what, ha what happens if we, if, we, uh, if we do that? So we can now have this representation where you can type a query in natural language and find videos uh, which have visual information which is relevant to the text. So if you type in glue, you can find videos where someone is gluing. You can type in glue wood, and you find videos where someone is gluing wood uh, pieces together. But you can form other queries like cutting wood or cut wood, and you find videos where someone is cutting wood. 
But really using the language allows you to f this kind of very large potential label space, cutting paper, someone is cutting paper, but you can even formulate a query which is more complex, like cutting paper in circle, and you find someone who is cutting paper in circle. So this is really a, um, well, potentially very large number, very large label space, which we obtain automatically by using the natural language. Um, and you have heard sort of a, a lot of the current methods which you sort of see uh, today, like the GPT, which is learned from text only, but also are using uh, or are trained from uh, visual and language information in a similar manner from a large number of examples uh, from the internet. Now, there is another way, so you, one can find these video examples using a natural language query, but there is another way to probe how this system works, and that's the task, what's called video question answering. That's like putting the system to a test. You show it a video, this is a still frame of the video, and give it a natural language question. What type of material is the man touching? Or, this is another, this is, but imagine this is a whole video, I'm showing a single frame, what animal is shown as a cutout? And the system has to answer that question. So it's a little bit it's like testing the system, if you wish. And then the system can answer the ground truth in this case is wood, and there are some answers by some, uh, by some systems, and there is uh, in one system, in this case, is, the, is ours, which actually can answer this correct and similar here. So this is just an example of how you can test, you know, these language and, and vision systems, how well they work. Um, and one particle, this is, again, I'm trying to focus more on the recent work, which has been uh, published at NURIPS uh, last year in December, is that it turns out that some of these, these large models, you can actually they are pre-trained on a lot of text, both in, in vision and in language, but you can fine-tune them together using a very lightweight, what's called adapters layer. So these are the, shown here in pink, uh, which from much less training data for a task like video question answering. So I'll skip some of the details, but show you some of the results on this test. You can measure what's good, and you can measure performance of the different systems. And I will let fo let's focus on the first column. These are the different uh, you know, data sets, different tests. Let's focus on the first column. And the different rows are the dif results of the different systems. Um, and, uh, and what's interesting is also the second column, which is the number of parameters, which can be quite large, say, you know, going up to one billion in this example. Uh, and higher is better. So it's like, what's the percentage of answers the system gets correct? So the first thing is, well, you know, th there is still some way to go. So from these questions, which maybe, you know, my daughter, who is seven years old, she would probably answer all of them if it was in check. The current systems can do 63%. So there is still four out of 10 questions which they just can't get. So it sort of shows there is still a quite large way to go uh, on this problem. And what's interesting that on this particular data set, even recently, you know, we now all talk about the GPT, the GPT-4 has published results on the same data set. So we are also, of course, wondering well, how well the, you know, <laughs> the, the system is supposed to be very good, how well it's doing, and this is the number which they report. So it's doing 45. So that system is sort of five out of 10 questions is failing. So. Um, and which is still quite a bit below uh, what we can do. So I think it just shows that at least on the visual side, the problem is not solved, and we have uh, quite a long way to go still. Um, so that was on the first part uh, on the learning visual language representations. And uh, what I would like to talk next is that, so we can now uh, sort of, this, these systems can answer questions maybe out of video, we can describe video in language, we can search the videos, but still these are visual language representations. If you want to transfer some skill to a robot, we need a more than that. We need to extract also geometry, physics, relations. Relations are, um, um, there are interactions in the world, and that's the, 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 what I want to show you some results here. And this is an example again of an instructional video on the left, and this is the reconstructed 3D motion of the person uh, here and the tool. So what's important is that we have the person and the tool, and the yellow arrows are estimates of the interaction forces between the person and the ground and person and the tool. So uh, well, 
maybe play this again. Uh, so this is, th these are, the these are the type of reconstructions we can get from instructional videos. And why it's interesting, well, we would like to transfer these motions on, onto a robot, and this gives us a more physical, geometric, and dynamic representation uh, of the scene. I'll show you a few more examples where on the top input video, there is some 2D extracted information, and on the bottom are two different views of the reconstructed motion with the estimates of the forces. And again, what's important that we don't reconstruct only the person, but also the tool the person is working with, and we do have some estimates of the um, interaction forces. And Maybe I'll skip, so you get the idea of what, uh, what we can do here. And uh, so this, this was sort of one example we can extract from video, but then what I would like to show you is that we can take this motion, this reconstructed motion, and transfer it to a robot. And here I would like to also say that during the lunch time, there will be a, uh, so Vlado Petrik from my team will be a giving, I think it, uh, we don't have a robot downstairs, but he'll be giving more details about uh, this type of work of how we can use videos to, to program or to, to guide robots. Um, and so what, you know, you can get more details from him uh, during lunch time is this example where we have an input video again and we can use that to, to to train a robot to perform the same task of uh, transforming the, the material from one place to the other. And what behind that is that we, is really the reconstructed 3D motion, which then can guide the simulation environment, which is otherwise it's very difficult to do that without that, to then transfer the motion onto the robot. And you know, we've done that on uh, sort of different, from different videos. Again, you know, from the internet, people doing different things, which we tested in different simulated environments. And what's interesting, because we focus on the tool, it, the same algorithm can be applied on more robots with different morphology, going all the way from different degrees of freedom, but to even the humanoid robot. And so this is actually, we don't have the robot in the building, but we have uh, colleagues who have this. Uh, so this is an example of the, the learned motions. But we have, we collaborate with colleagues in France, in Laz in Toulouse, who actually do have the Talos robot uh, running, and we would like to um, eventually be able to transfer, you know, have the robot to really watch a video and then be able to reproduce or transfer that skill, the motion, uh, in the real world. Uh, and uh, so finally, in some of the results, I would like to mention Again, a work on the boundary of uh, computer vision, learning, and, uh, and robotics, uh, where uh, one of the key issues when you would like to manipulate or interact with the world around you is having uh, some kind of a representation of the environment. And in this case, uh, this is the input scene, which has several objects lying on top of each other. And if you, as a human, you could just easily go and pick up one of these things. But for a robot to be able to interact, to pick up an individual object is still quite challenging. Uh, so we designed an algorithm which can actually recognize the different objects uh, and obtain a reconstruction of the scene like this, where the different objects are different colors, and then it's quite easy for the robot to generate a motion to uh, grab one of these two objects. So this problem is called 6D pose estimation, where you have a set of known cut models, but you don't know their position in the scene. It's one of the oldest problems in computer vision, um, which you know, has been addressed for uh, you know, 40 years. Uh, but we've designed methods which really combine and leverage the power of neural networks and large amount of synthetic training data to do that with very high accuracy. Here are some examples of, in the top row is input images, uh, in the middle row are the uh, overlaid 3D models on the scene, and at the bottom row are the reconstructed uh, 3D reconstructions uh, visualized. And, and really, by leveraging the power of large networks and, tra and synthetic training data, uh, there is a competition on multiple different data sets, and we managed to do quite uh, well on this task, which we were very happy, very happy about. And now we are working on to more how to transfer these algorithms on real robots and integrate them into the action perception and learning loop, which is uh, very exciting. And, we, and I will mention that later we also collaborate down, uh, with the test bed uh, to really transfer these uh, results into industrial applications. Uh, 
so this can work not only for rigid objects, but also if the object is articulated like the robot here. So we can estimate not only the 6D pose, but actually also the articulation angles uh, of the system, which uh, then allows us to, uh, you know, to then maybe interact with the robot if you want, because you can know what the pose the robot is in. And the most recent results are going in the direction where we really leverage very large data sets of millions of images. And if you didn't, uh, these are all synthetically generated. They, are, they look quite um, realistic. Uh, they are full scenes. And by synthesizing images like this, we also uh, generate effects like occlusion uh, patterns, which really make this work uh, even on new objects which you, un which you don't see in training time. Uh, so this was just published at Coral last year and is a collaboration with NVIDIA. Uh, and it allows us now, so we have lots of data at training, but allows us to now handle by robot objects which, have, uh, which are new, which we have not seen during training, and handle even difficult situations where objects are partially occluded, uh, like here. And uh, then the robot can just look at the scene uh, identify the, even these objects have not been seen at training, identify them and then uh, grasp them. Uh, some, uh, some of it, you know, it's difficult for special objects which are uh, thin, uh, which, you know, the Ob estimating their pose of objects like scissors is not easy. Uh, and I will, uh, I will skip this. And again, I will point you uh, to the demo downstairs where uh, Vladimir will show you how we can apply now this quite powerful approach to estimated poses of objects to, to solve difficult uh, robotic problems. So this is a problem, the narrow tunnel problem, where the goal is to take the object and uh, pass it through the tunnel. So for the robot, to plan this, it requires to sort of multi-contact planning, which is uh, and not not easy to do. And but by having, uh, we, we can solve this problem by having um, example videos of humans solving the task, and the robot can just then reproduce that motion. Um, and so, in the last few minutes, I would like to talk uh, more about the outlook, like what next. Uh, so the project has been wonderful. It really allowed us to, to build a, a team here at CIRC uh, uh, of you know, and several international students, uh, and, and, and we had a, a, really a sequence of wonderful visitors as well. So, but what's going next? So really, the, I would like to mention three things. The first one is we have really developed some which I think are very powerful algorithms. Uh, but we would like to apply them in practice. And I think that's quite a unique opportunity in this building because we can have uh, people who do strong science, but also people who actually care about transferring these results into practical applications. And this is an example of, uh, it's a European project, uh, but where we have really industrial partners in, uh, and the goal is to do small batch production. So if you manufacture a large number of cars, you can afford to build a uh, production line just for this task, and it can run for several years. Problem is that there are other tasks which are uh, what's called small batch. It turns out production of airplanes. Every airplane is unique, so it's a small batch problem. So there, you can't quite construct a line which will just spit out airplanes at the, uh, at the end. So we are looking at how we can utilize uh, the fact that now it can be a mobile robot instead of a classic line, and it can perform the task in the environment. Uh, another example is the, uh, is the manufacturing of uh, elevators, which also turns out every elevator is unique. So it's, it's exciting. We can now really test these and you know, transfer these algorithms to real-world settings, and we collaborate uh, on this with the testbed downstairs. Uh, then the, uh, the other wonderful opportunity uh, is uh, to now look, up, uh, uh, to look at, uh, so, so far we've been looking mostly at how to learn, uh, how we can teach or how we can learn from humans how to perform different tasks. I think the next big problem is how uh, robots can learn from each other. 
Uh, so I've been given this uh, very nice project now to funding to continue this effort. So I'm excited about this, and hopefully we, in another five years, you know, we will, can show you some uh, results on this, how robots can learn from each other in different environments, and also have geometric representations of the environment. Uh, and the, the third area which I'm really excited about as well, which provides also a continuation, is, um, uh, is machine learning for uh, protein engineering. It seems a little bit far, but it turns out that robots are these systems in our macro world, but it turns out there are these systems in the micro world, which are proteins, which, are really, uh, which also have to respect physical and geometric properties. So we've been looking and have a growing team of people uh, at uh, looking uh, at problems in that space. And one of this is an example of, uh, of our recent work, and this is in collaboration with experts in this area, and this is the team of uh, Jiřína Morsky at Masaryk University and Tomáš Pluskal at UOHB just across the street. Uh, so we've been looking at methods for, um, uh, for this world, and this is an example of a method which allows us uh, to study the effect of drug candidates on these proteins. So first step is the molecular dynamic simulation. And this is one of them. This is a protein involved in Alzheimer's disease, very important one, without the drug and with the potential drug candidate. But of course, these simulations generate a lot of data. We have to var validate them in laboratory experiments, not done here, but in the uh, biology labs. But then machine learning comes in to analyze this type of data and analyze the effect and we develop new algorithms to analyze the effects of, the, of, the, of this drug candidate on the, on the protein, its dynamics, what's important. So we may have heard of alpha fold, which predicts static structure from the sequence. Here we really care about dynamics of the protein, how it moves over time. So we are also very excited about this and applications in this area. And final thing, which I want to uh, mention, uh, uh, before this, a bit of an advertisement also for tomorrow, where there is a, a day of the, these are logos of the European uh, networks in the area of AI. And um, I think uh, this is also a big opportunity for us uh, to, so we have also, I myself, but also others in the Zoof are putting a lot of energy in also uh, bringing these network here, uh, bringing these networks here to this country, and and having the uh, opportunities to collaborate with others, and I think it's opportunity now for us, and we are on this uh, brink of an opportunity for us now to continue that uh, and this, these wonderful collaborations. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. Questions. Thank you very much for your presentation. With nice videos in and these nice pictures. So, question. No questions. I saw that. Ah, Holger, please. I would have abstained, you know, but but I think somebody needs to ask one question. So I'll I'll do that because, you know, many interesting things you've discussed. Fantastic. Um, I'm curious. You talked about long sequences that need to be planned in your production outlook work. I find that interesting because engineered systems, when you manufacture them, increasingly have that, right? So I'm curious, what's your intuition? Do you think um, sub-symbolic neural network techniques alone will do that? Or, or do you think that this might be an area where actually bringing together techniques from the two worlds that Josef spoke, spoke about so, uh, Josef uh, Urban spoke about so eloquently uh, might actually be uh, an easier approach to that? What's your intuition? That's a great question, thank you. I didn't talk about the details and some, in some sense on purpose. I just wanted to show you the videos. I would be very happy to talk with anyone about the details. The approach we've taken, is, and this is also partly because we have wonderful collaborators in robotics. So we are not really trying to bring the best of the both worlds. To really, I mean, in robotics, there's been a lot of wonderful work in planning, in task and motion planning. And we are trying to connect them with uh, more learning and learning from video. So what the results which you know, I haven't shown, you will see downstairs for the planning. It's a combination where we augmented uh, you know, some of the best planning algorithms uh, from robotics, the RRT algorithm, by, you know, from the data, from the video, to achieve, to solve the task. So my intuition at the moment is that, you know, we, there's so much wonderful work in robotics, uh, which, you know, and we, we should build on both, on top of, you know, stand on the shoulders of the giants in the both worlds. Uh, 
to solve the problem and let's see you know, how it goes. And I'm very happy to have wonderful collaborators from robotics in this area. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. There will be again time in the afternoon.